and mercy and slighted thy word. Did not thy wrath in its terrors awaken? Give to us peace in our time, O Lord. God, the all-righteous one, man hath defied thee, yet to eternity standeth thy word. Falsehood and wrong shall not tarry beside thee. Give to us peace in our time. And turn with me, if you will, to the second psalm, which was read earlier. And the last two verses, which read, Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Now what I intend to share with you this evening is rather different from my usual type and form of message, and that for a very particular reason, that we are this weekend especially commemorating uh, a very alarming anniversary. If you follow the news even briefly, you will, of course, remember that there have been commemorations um, in different parts of the, the world, uh, but particularly in New York City yesterday, of the appalling attack on the World Trade Center, which took place on the 11th of September 2001, exactly 20 years ago this, week this weekend. And I believe the significance of that awesome event thus commemorated is too important for us simply to uh, acknowledge and then continue on our way. Because the situation in the world has become even more serious uh, in the last 20 years, particularly since the invasion of Afghanistan was prompted by that attack on the Twin Towers. And now we know the sad outcome that the Western uh, powers have retreated from that land. Uh, you, you are, I am sure, are familiar with the developments in recent days, in recent uh, weeks. And uh, what's been very noticeable, uh, particularly yesterday in the coverage that I was able to uh, detect, was that there was no reference to the evil origin of that attack on the World Trade Center. Yes, a great deal of attention 
and that justly so, to the grief uh, of those bereaved 20 years ago. And uh, many of those who were children at that time, who have now grown to adulthood, who lost loved ones as the Twin Towers uh, collapsed. And of course, a number of you here this evening, you weren't born when this terrible event took place. But it is, I believe, very important for us to understand for the very reason that the evil cause of all this uh, was not referred to in my hearing, in what I heard yesterday, that the cause of what happened was, of course, the ideology of Islam. And it's not politically correct to allude to that fact, but it is important for us to do so simply because without understanding that we shall not see the real nature of the uh, challenge of the gospel in the days in which we're, we're living. The second thing I want to say by way of introduction is that my own arousal of interest in the threat and the problem of Islam came as a result of the Egyptian students whom we hosted for uh, 12 or 13 years students coming to the University of East Anglia to learn the British teaching methods in English, maths and science. There were three groups per year, averaging around 70. Most of them were Muslims, of course, but there was always a sizable percentage of Christians of different denominations. And um, Stephen made contact with them uh, during uh, your PGCE course at the UEA. And uh, we came into contact with a number of these dear Christians um, from Egypt. And uh, this continued from the days at Great Ellingham uh, right down to uh, not many years ago here in, in, in Norwich. And it was because of their concern for the growth of Islam in this country that they were very alarmed at the situation when they themselves were not allowed to repair their church buildings in Egypt without special government approval, let alone build a new building. And they were alarmed that here in this country, mosques were going up like mushrooms. And uh, this was a truly alarming situation. And they were simply astonished that we were having such a sympathy in government circles, of course, and cultural uh, circles uh, to this evil religion which has brought for 13 centuries misery and mayhem upon those parts of the world where it has spread. That itself is a long story. So that is the thinking behind uh, what I wish to share with you this evening. And there's a third reason too. I read a recent report in the British Church newspaper that a very significant percentage of Christians in the United States thought that you could get to heaven by trusting in Muhammad and Buddha as well as Jesus. As if there was a kind of equivalence and that you choose your own route and you'll arrive safely. Now that is an appalling admission. Now we know that there are more Muslim folk in the city of Norwich. Uh, if you were to go shopping and you started speaking with such and you got into a conversation with them or with anybody else for that matter, if they were to ask you a question like this, um, what is different about the Christian view of salvation from the Islamic view of salvation? Uh, what would your answer be? What answer would you give as a Christian? Do you know what you need to know in order to be a faithful witness in a situation which will be a growing problem because the events in Afghanistan will undoubtedly, as we did hear on the news, uh, embolden uh, jihadi groups to commit more atrocities in this country and elsewhere. So the worst thing that is possible in this situation is for Christians not to be aware of what is the truth of the gospel and of salvation, especially when there is the kind of confusion that that article uh, reflected. 
It all boils down to this. What is the way of salvation? What is the way to heaven? We as Christians say, and I'm sure you would say this, well, the only way to heaven is through the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now, 20 years ago, in response to 9-11, uh, I produced this booklet called The Path to Paradise. And uh, I'm going to read this to you. I hope not just to read it, but with life and I hope with conviction and share with you things which need to be known in our situation. You'll be hearing some things which might shock you, some things which might alarm you, but other things, I trust, which will reassure you and give you a foundation so that in the days and the weeks and the months to come, if you are asked a question like that, what's different between Christianity and other faiths, you'll be able to give a clear answer that will honour God and be a blessing to those to whom you speak. For never was it more urgent for the true, authentic Christian message to be proclaimed. So then, the path to paradise. Christ or Muhammad? Death is in the news, more than usual that is. The thousands who died in the USA on September the 11th, the continuing violence in Northern Ireland, as it was then, and the threatening clouds of war, these realities are concentrating the minds of most of us just now. Indeed, everyone is forced to face the inevitable fact of their death, including those who prefer an alcohol and drug-driven dream world of denial, those who just don't want to listen to this kind of thing. Even in secular Western civilization, religion of some sort flourishes because of death. The need of some kind of insurance is sometimes felt even by the most godless. We'd better be ready for God just in case. Sadly, they are too easily satisfied by a touch of ritual and a dose of nominalism. Needless to say, the reality of death as a consequence of sin highlights the nature and necessity of the Christian gospel. The life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is at the heart of the Christian solution to sin and death. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, Christ himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That's from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Thus the only real relief from all the bad news is the good news of Christ. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He alone is the answer to a despairing, dying and doomed world. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, Acts 4, verse 12. For those who just shrug their shoulders and say, so what? Hear the words of John the Baptist. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John 3, verse 36. But if this remains the unambiguous and assured faith of all Bible-believing Christians, Muslims and others say differently. We are told that Muhammad and other religious leaders provide us with equally certain paths to paradise. The terrible events of September the 11th have brought the character and claims of Islam into sharp focus. Indeed, the five-page Arabic document discovered by the FBI in the luggage of the suspected terrorist Mohammed Atta, who was incidentally Egyptian, demands our attention. First, this document silences the assertions of those 
who deny that Islam provided any religious motivation for the attacks on New York and Washington and Pennsylvania. Besides giving instructions about clothes, knives, wills, IDs and passports, the document gave the suicide bombers the following instructions. In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most compassionate, remember the battle of the Prophet against the infidels as he went on building the Islamic State. Continue to recite the Quran. You have to be convinced that those few hours that are left in your life are very few. From there you will begin to live the happy life, the infinite paradise. Be optimistic. The Prophet Muhammad has was always optimistic. Always remember the verses that you would wish for death before you meet it, if you only knew what the reward after death will be. You will be entering paradise. You will be entering the happiest life, everlasting life. So we must ask, did the Quran actually supply the terrorists with the incentives they needed? The answer could not be clearer. And here are just a few extracts from the Quran, which very many people have simply not read. For example, fight for the cause of Allah. Those that deny our revelations, says Allah, we will burn in hellfire. As for those that have faith and do good works, we should admit them to gardens watered by running streams, where wedded to chaste virgins, they shall abide for ever. The believers who do good works, whether men or women, shall enter the gardens of paradise. So it's a very carnal paradise. Indulging lusts, that's what their paradise is. The true believers fight for the cause of Allah. Fight then against the friends of Satan. Therefore fight for the cause of Allah. Allah has given those that fight with their goods and their persons a higher rank than those who stay at home. They are the so-called moderates, uh, Muslims. He has promised all a good reward, but far richer is the recompense of those who fight for him. When the sacred months are over, slay the idolaters wherever you find them, arrest them, besiege them, and lie in ambush everywhere for them. Make war on the leaders of unbelief. Proclaim a woeful punishment to those that hoard up gold and silver and do not spend it in Allah's cause. And much of the funding for that event and other similar atrocities in the last 20 years has been from Saudi Arabia. The day will surely come when all their treasures shall be heated in the fire of hell. Believers, why is it that when it is said of you, march in the cause of Allah, you linger slothfully in the land? Are you content with this life in preference to the life to come? Few indeed are the blessings of this life compared with those of the life to come. If you do not fight, he will punish you sternly and replace you by other men. Whether armed or well-equipped, march on and fight in the cause of Allah with your wealth and your persons. Prophet, make war on the unbelievers and the hypocrites and deal rigorously with them. Hell shall be their home and evil state. And lastly, believers, make war on the infidels who dwell around you. Now let me ask you, that is the religion of peace. That's what we're told. Islam means peace. That extensive selection surely gives the lie to such a false claim. Who then can deny the Quranic factor in the recent tragic terror? And second, while the Quran gives such exhortations and encouragements to those who fight in Allah's cause, just how sure were Muhammad Atta and his fellow terrorists of reaching paradise? To aid them, the five-page document provided the following prayers. Now, this would astound you, but uh, this is what it said. In the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate, I pray to you, Allah, to forgive me from all my sins, to allow me to glorify you in every possible way. O oh Allah, open all your doors for me. O oh Allah, who answers prayers and answers those who ask you, I am asking you for your help. 
I am asking you for forgiveness. I am asking you to lighten my way. I am asking you to lift the burden I feel. Allah, I trust in you. Allah, I lay myself in your hands. I ask you with the light of your faith that has lit the whole world and enlightened all darkness on this earth to guide me until you approve of me. And once you do, that's my ultimate goal. There is no God but Allah, I being a sinner, we are of Allah, and to Allah we return. What a shocking prayer. The most pressing question is obvious. Did Muhammad Attar and his terrorist friends wake up in paradise? If so, they must be the first cases of unrepentant killers to be welcomed there. Indeed, these men were murderers, not martyrs. Were they forgiven? How could they be? Yes, according to the Christian gospel, penitent murderers, besides those guilty of sexual and other wickedness, may be saved. Psalm 51 and 1 Corinthians 6 make plain what is available to those who repent. However, it is impossible to be a penitent murderer while pursuing the deed of murder. No, Muhammad Attar and his fellow murderers died utterly deceived. They had a rude awakening on the other side. The book of Revelation describes their terrible destiny. Revelation 21 verse 8 says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murderers, sexually immoral sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Of course, as this verse indicates, these Islamic terrorists will not be alone. Islam doesn't have the monopoly of evil, in other words. They will be shoulder to shoulder with murdering, materialistic and immoral Americans, Brits and others, as well as their non-violent fellow Muslims. Indeed, terrorism is not the only evil in the world. Terrorists do not have a monopoly on evil. Pleasure-seeking, sin-loving, Bible-scoffing, Christ-blaspheming Westerners are just as likely candidates for hell as the Muslim murderers of September the 11th, 2001. And why? Because if they die without repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, the only saviour of the world, there is no hope. For those who take the true message of Christianity seriously, there is simply no other conclusion. Christ's solemn account of the rich man and Lazarus sheds much light on all this. That's found in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. Well might the rich man's words be the words of Muhammad Atta and his associates. Remember, he was one of those... He probably piloted one of the planes that uh, crashed into uh, one of the towers. There were two planes, as you may remember, attacking those uh, two buildings with such devastating consequences. This is what our Lord's parable says. I beg you, therefore, Father Abraham, that you would send someone to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may testify to them lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, that is, Jesus said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Of course, the Islamic document read by the terrorists does at least recognize the reality of sin and the need of forgiveness. However, however, their only hope is a religion based on works righteousness. And uh, their religion teaches them that if you give up your life in a violent terrorist activity, that's the sure way of getting to paradise. That's why the suicide bombers are so committed to what the evil that they do. They believe that 
whatever happens, they get to paradise. But did their terror even begin to qualify? Could their murderous madness possibly merit the mercy of God? Now, this is the key thing. Since Muslims deny that Christ was crucified, they cannot appeal to his atoning sacrifice for salvation. They argue that Christians have corrupt versions of the Bible and not the original account of Christ. But where is this uncorrupted original? If that was the word of God, would God have allowed it to be lost or destroyed? And that is our claim as Christians, that our Bible has solid evidence, solid certainty about its providence and its origins. And that was all five centuries before Muhammad was born. Interestingly, in Christ's account of the rich man, Father Abraham says that his brothers may learn the message of salvation from Moses and the prophets. In short, the gospel of salvation is found in the Old Testament as well as in the New. There, Moses foretold the coming of a prophet in Deuteronomy 18, 15, quoted by Stephen in Acts 7, 37. This was Christ, not Muhammad. And why? Well, Muhammad never performed the amazing deeds prophesied of the Messiah. The prophet Isaiah described the person and sacrificial sufferings of this prophet, priest and king. Here are some wonderful extracts from the wonderful evangelical prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, Isaiah 7.14. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Yes, Jesus is the Prince of Peace, not the Warlord. And then from Isaiah chapter 53, the astonishing prophecy concerning the cross. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53. The fact is that we all need a mediator. Because we are all hell-deserving sinners, it is impossible to appear naked before God and live. We need righteous apparel and an advocate, someone to speak on our behalf. Our Lord Jesus Christ gives us his righteousness. He is the very mediator we need, as Paul reminds us. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. This was the comfort of the first Christian martyr Stephen, facing a violent death at the hands of cruel persecutors. He was granted a sight of Christ his mediator. This from Acts 7 55. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they stoned Stephen as he was, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Elsewhere in the scriptures we're told that our ascended Lord Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father. In Stephen's vision, Jesus was standing up. And one commentator has suggested that the Lord Jesus rose from his seat to welcome the first martyr of the Christian era. I find that moving and powerful to think about. Thus, the message of the Gospel is clear, there is no other. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, as the Muslim document stated, burdened by our sins and needing God's approval in order to avoid hell, 
the message of his grace is the answer that we need. For the sake of Christ who suffered the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, 1 Peter 3.18, penitent and trusting sinners gain God's acceptance by the free pardon of their sins. When we trust in Christ, we receive the Father's approval because we approve of his Son. Thus the merit of Christ's sacrifice is imputed to us, or placed to our account, just as our guilt was imputed to him. And that teaching is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21. Only by honouring the Son do we honour the Father. John 5, 23. So rejecting Christ indicates a rejection of God. There is no other gospel, despite the treacherous denials of multi-faith liberals and other apostate deceivers. We cannot save ourselves. Salvation is about receiving, not achieving. Thank God! Salvation is available to anyone who repents of sin and turns to Christ. What do the scriptures say? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 verse 9 For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 1 Come to me, says our blessed Saviour, all you who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven, twenty-eight. If you trust in Christ, he will not only forgive you, he will begin to change you by his Spirit. You will live a life of good works, the fruit of the root of true saving faith. Ephesians 2.10 you will be kind and merciful to others. Your religious life will not be driven by hate and resentment. You will not seek to propagate the Christian faith by violence, cruelty, bitterness and death. You will not shame Christ and disfigure the gospel like medieval crusading Catholics or Roman Catholic and Protestant paramilitary thugs in Northern Ireland. As a sinner greatly forgiven, you will breathe love and forgiveness towards those who wrong you. Like Stephen, you will pray, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. So in the face of death, whether peaceful or violent, expected or sudden, by sickness or accident, what is the path to paradise? The New Testament points the way. As we read in the 23rd chapter of Luke's Gospel, Then the penitent criminal said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. This is the truth we all need to hear. This is the way to the true paradise of God, which, unlike the fleshly, lustful paradise of Islam, is a realm and state of perfect holiness and happiness. Reader, or hearers, believe the pure truth of God. Trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. Depend on his once-for-all sacrifice for sin. Live a life of faith, love and holiness. Love God and your fellow human beings, and when the time comes, a place in paradise awaits you. What tragically cannot be said of Muhammad Atta and his associates, or anyone who rejects Christ, or anyone who rejects Christ, may be sung of all who live and die in Jesus. As Charles Wesley enables us to conclude this message. Rejoice for all Christians deceased. Our loss is their infinite gain. Their souls out of prison released are freed from their bodily chains. 
with songs let us follow their flight, and mount with their spirits above, escaped to the mansions of light, and lodged in the Eden of love. That is why we're Christians, and that's why we have something, the only thing worth saying to those who think differently, whether they're Muslims or anything else, or secular for that matter. So let's be clear about what we believe and how we are to share it. Now, if any of you found all that material a little hard to uh, follow, I doubt whether you'll remember a huge amount, yet I do have copies of what I've just shared with you <coughs> in this booklet form, and I have some extra copies here. You're perfectly welcome to take a copy home, to reread what I've been sharing with you now audibly, and then to reflect upon it and pray over it, so that should, to go back to my early introductory comment, should anyone ask you such questions about faith and why the Christian faith and no other, uh, and what is wrong with uh, Islam or other faiths, well, you'll be able to uh, refer to this, memorize it, and have something at your fingertips to be able to share with others, so that thereby you will point others to our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. For he is the only one who can save us. May this be true for us and for people everywhere. Amen. Our final hymn is number 808. If that hymn, the, the first verse of which I quoted just now by Charles Wesley was in our hymn book, I would have chosen that, but sadly it isn't. But uh, we all know, and the whole world, I think, knows and loves and feels the power of our final hymn, which is number 808. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, oh, abide with me, hymn number 808.
and loving Father, we have considered alarming, serious, but important things this evening. In the light of what we've considered, in the light of the event of 20 years ago commemorated yesterday, we bless you for the everlasting gospel. We thank you that there is an answer to the human predicament in all its sin and evil in the diversity of its wicked manifestations. But we thank you for the good news of everlasting salvation in and through your dearly beloved Son. We pray therefore, Lord, that you will so confirm our each and every heart as trusting in him alone for our salvation, trusting in his shed blood to wash away our sins, trusting in the gift of your Holy Spirit to renew and purify our natures and then to prepare us that we come to the end of our ill earthly pilgrimage and to be brought at length to our everlasting rest. Therefore, Lord, lead us and guide us throughout the remainder of this, our short, uncertain earthly life and pilgrimage, and until we come to the glory everlasting and there to everlastingly, joyfully, with the entire ransomed host from all the history of the world, to worship and adore and sing the praises of you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God our Father, and the blessing of the Holy Spirit rest upon us, each and every one, this night, and for evermore. Amen. <laughs>